welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Jen Cobray. Come on, stand on your feet and let's go before the Lord. Father, we just come to you in the name of Jesus, giving you all the praise, glory, and all the honor. We thank you, Father, we haven't come to hear from a man. We haven't come to hear from a woman. We haven't come to hear from tall man, short man, black man, white man, brown man. We haven't come to hear from an old man, young man. Well, we don't give a flip about that stuff, God. What we care about is we have come to hear from the teacher of the church who's the Holy Spirit. So all of us are in agreement. Holy Spirit, come, touch us, heal us, strengthen us. Open us up and pour yourself in a great way with wisdom into our hearts. And we'll give you the praise, glory as you bless us in Everything that we do, may it go to the glory of God. Now, Lord, as you bless us, we want you to bless all the churches in the Inland Empire, as well as around the planet that are preaching and hearing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. So bless them, Father. Bless our Baptist brothers and Lutherans and Methodists, Episcopalian, Charismatics, Pentecostals. Thank you for Calvary chapels in Harvest Oak Valley and Oasis and the way, the will, uh, the way, the well, the Inland Christian Center, the Assemblies of God, Four Square, Catholic. We just love them all, God. We're not against anybody that's preaching the gospel. They're our brothers and our sisters, and we're grateful for them. Bless them as you would bless us, and we'll give you the praise, give you the glory. In Jesus' mighty name, with a great big shout, we say amen. amen. Go ahead and take your seat and go with me to Hebrews, the sixth chapter. Before I give you the title of the message, what I want to do is I want to rewind your thinking just a few minutes. I want to go back to, if you will, the sixth chapter, verse number 12, talk to you a little bit about that, to kind of refresh your thinking so that we can understand verse 14 and 15 a little better, instead of just jumping off from verse 14, build to 15. So listen closely and pay attention, then I'll come back and give you, for those of you that are making notes, and all of you should be making notes, I'll give you a title of the message. Hebrews 6 chapter, remember in verse number 12, it said these words, great verse, in uh, the 6th chapter, verse number 12 says these words, it says that you do not become sluggish, in other words, don't lay around, do nothing, just, you know, hang on, be a deadbeat Christian, that's what he's just really talking about. But imitate those who faith and patience inherit the promises. I love the word promises. Notice the word promises. It doesn't say promise. It says promises. Because you know what? A lot of times people try to say, well, the promise is heaven. Can I tell you something? Of course the promise is heaven, but it's a whole lot more than heaven. That's why it's plural on this. It's a lot more. You know, heaven's already taken care of. In heaven, you're not going to have any lack. In heaven, there's no sickness, no disease. The streets are made of gold. You're going to have it all made when you get to heaven. The object is between now and heaven, what are you going to do with your life? There are promises that God made to Abraham. Now he tells us, if you remember the word imitate up there is followers. Some of your translations say that. Remember it was called followship is what we called it. The great leaders are great followers. Followers are the things of God. So when God tells us to follow somebody because somebody attained something, he's trying to say to us that if you follow the way they followed, you also will attain something. And what it is you attain are the promises that God gives you. Man, that's amazing. I know a lot of Christians, they call themselves Christians, they love God, they even go to church, but guess what? They're not attaining the promises. They just live normal lives, they just get by, they barely get by, they wonder why most of the time, why some people are blessed and other people aren't blessed. But he makes this statement, remember this when Pastor Luke presented it so clearly and so wonderfully, through faith and patience. If you're going to have faith, you're going to believe God for something you can't see. Believe God for something you don't know how it's going to work. Believe God, you don't know where it's coming from, but you're believing God because it's a will of God for your life. Then you're going to have to have a quality added to your faith. And the quality here is the word patience. Patience is not asked to us for no reason whatsoever. Oftentimes, when we're believing God for something, it does not come immediately. It doesn't come for a long period of time. Think about how much patience David had to have. Think about how much patience Joseph had to have. Think about how much patience Paul had to have. Think about how much patience most people that ever attain anything like Abraham himself 
Think about how much patience they had to have before it ever manifested itself or comes to pass. So you and I learn this incredible, wonderful message that if we're going to follow somebody, let's follow somebody who does something, inherits the promises, and how do you get it? Through faith. And how do you get it? By applying to faith, patience. And then I love this. Then it came along the very next verse, verse number 13. Remember, Pastor Dan presented it so well that God made a promise to Abraham because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself. In other words, where's God going to make a promise and say, I'll back it up, I guarantee it. Could God come along and say, you know, I guarantee this promise by Washington Mutual. Think about it. They're gone, man. How about it? if you're old enough, do you remember the name Security Pacific? Does anybody remember that? Five of you. Okay, but let me just tell you, here's how it works. There is nothing to swear by that's any better. The neat thing about Pastor Dan's message was that God didn't have to swear by anything. He could have just come along and said, listen, I'm making the promise. I don't have to put any guarantees on it at all. But when he put a guarantee on it, he said, my throne is at stake. All that I am and who I am, God Almighty, creator of the heavens and the earth, the one that rules it all now is at stake if I don't keep my part of this promise. Wow. He said it to Abraham. He's saying it to you because, guess what? You are products of Abraham. He's father of faith for us. And he makes a statement that he could swear by no other, so he swears by himself. I don't know about you, but stop and think about it for a moment. If God's going to get into a promise for me, I want him to guarantee it by himself. In fact, it's so neat to think about this just for a few moments. Just consider it like this. I mean, if God said, I promise, and he brings in an outside source, and I guarantee it by that outside source, that outside source fails, your promise is no good. So God makes a promise based on himself. There's nobody else involved, just you and me, his promise. How could it fail? God would have to fail. That's the point. Wow, pretty powerful. Then verse number 14, when we start getting into this, God loved you so much, wants to prosper you and bless you so much. Could I just make verse 14 clear to you? He now comes along and he says what he's going to do. Surely. I love the word surely. Didn't come along, that's not a woman's name. He's saying, for without a doubt, with a chat, without a fat, with a fact, this is the way it is. Listen to this, surely. Surely means, man, there is no doubt about it. It's going to happen. You can go to the bank on it. You can stake your life on it. God's staking his throne on it. Surely, he says, I will bless you. And listen to this. Blessings, I will bless you and multiply and I will multiply you. A lot of people don't understand when that comes to multiplication. He's not just talking about add more to your life, add more to more, and then once you get more, he's going to add more. Can I tell you something about God? God is such an abundant God. Do you see the word subtraction up there? Do you see the word up there that says division? I will divide your life. I will subtract from your life. You little sucker for following me, I'm going to knock the snot out of you. Doesn't say that at all. God loves you so much. Listen to what he's saying. He is saying this tremendous truth. I will multiply. You have a God on your side of addition and multiplication. But not, here's the cool part. Hold your finger right there on that uh, Hebrews 6 chapter in verse uh, number, if you will, in verse number 14. And go with me to Genesis 22. If you'll go with me to Genesis 22, here's Abraham, who he made the covenant with, who he made the promise to, and Abraham has just finished offering up his son Isaac. And when God saw that God who uh, saw that Abraham loved his son so much, but he would not hold his son back, God was more important even than his own son, then God makes a statement to Abraham. The statement that he makes to Abraham has to do with you. Ooh. The statement he makes to Abraham has to do with you. He makes this statement. He says this in verse number 15. Then the angel of the Lord called on Abraham the second time out of heaven and said, myself, I love this, don't you? Myself. In other words, I haven't sworn by anybody else. There's nobody involved in it but me. There's nobody can fail but me and God. God's in it. There's nobody can fail. You see, nobody can screw up on the other end, and so it makes it null and void. 
He says, myself, I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done these things, I have not, not withheld your son, your only son. Verse number 17. Blessed, I will bless you. Multiply it, I will multiply you. And then he defines it. Watch this. And he says, your descendants as the stars of the heaven and the sand and which is on the seashore. And your descendants shall possess the gates of their enemies. In other words, he comes along and he says, I want to bless you so much, not that you just get blessings upon blessings, but I want to bless you so much that your descendants get blessed. That your children's children get blessed. In other words, if you're going to hook up with God, don't expect God just to do something for you. God wants to do something for you, your children, your children's children, and your children's children's children. Oh, my goodness. God is a God of, of if you will, of generations. God wants your descendants to be blessed. And so this is not just about you getting into this for yourself. This is not just about you. This is about your children's children's children. This is about the future, the destiny, the purpose of your family heritage. God wants to bless you so much that your children get blessed. Wow, that's amazing to think about that. And I love the part that says, and the descendants shall possess the gates of their enemy. See the word gates? You ought to circle it in your Bible. The word gates means government. In other words, the enemy that governs over the things of your family's future is now being defeated by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And they will reign over the enemy's governments. Man. In other words, here's what the New Testament says. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. <laughs> is anybody listening? So good, go back with me to Hebrews in the sixth chapter. But I want to point something out to you. I want to point out, if I can, I want to take you to Hebrews, the sixth chapter, verse number 15. I want to pop it up on the overhead, and I want you to read this. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. See the last part of the verse that says, obtain the promise? That's different then Hebrews, the 12th chapter, but it's almost the same thing three verses later. Now, wait a minute. He's saying the same thing two different ways. In fact, let's take a look at, if you will, Hebrews, the 6th chapter, verse number 12. Let me put that up. It says, and that you do not become sluggish, but imitate or follow those who through faith and patience inherit the promise. Wait a minute. Verse 12 is inheriting the promise. Verse 15 is obtaining the promise. In fact, let me have you highlight it because I want you to see that. John, could you do me a favor? See the word inherit up there? Would you highlight it so the people could see we're saying the same thing, but we're saying it two different ways. Inherit the promise, verse 12. Verse 15, I want you to take a look at it again. Go to verse number 15. It says obtain the promise. Could you highlight the word obtain? Now, what's the difference between obtaining and inheriting? Did you know that people can inherit and not always obtain? There's a difference between inheriting and getting it. <laughs> not always do people who inherit get what they inherit. There's probably millions, maybe billions of dollars out there that someone left someone and they don't even know who it was. They left it or how to get a hold of them and someone is watching it. So they got an inheritance and they never obtain it. And God loves you so much. He's not interested in you just having an inheritance. He wants you to have, guess what? Obtain the inheritance. Because without you obtaining it, it does no good whatsoever. If I give you a billion dollars in inheritance and you don't know it, you'll never spend it. What good was the inheritance? So God goes beyond even just inheriting. I love this translation, if you will, of the translator's translation on this is so brilliant because he makes it very clear that in three verses, he says the same thing two different ways. One inherits, you can have it, by following those that are faith and patience, and one obtains, actually gets what they inherit. Wow. Now go back with me and let's see if we can see something different in the verse. Verse number 15 says this, and I love this. And so after he had... Pace. I love the word after. Did you ever know and think about there's something you have to do in order for something to come to pass? 
Have you ever noticed that God doesn't bless you just because you're pretty or smart, nice, or talented, or gifted? God doesn't bless you because you're a certain culture background. God doesn't bless you because you're tall or short or you can sing or anything like that. God doesn't do that. In other words, in order for you to get the promises out, you're going to have to put something in. The verse 12 said, faith and patience. But now verse 15 comes along and says, patience and endurance. And it's in the patience, faith with patience and endurance that gets you the obtaining of the promises. There's a formula here, simple. Let me put it to you like this. Faith, believe in God for something you can't see and know how it's going to come to pass. You just know it's God. You believe in God for doing something great, doing something mighty in your life. Along with patience, because it's not going to come as quick as you think it is. And then you've got to endure, keep on keeping on, brings the promises, obtaining the promises. So this formula, faith plus patience plus endurance equals Promises. Endurance is such a funny little word. You know what it means? It means simply this. Keeping on, keeping on. Standing when you don't know how to stand anymore. That you just keep on. I don't know how it's going to work, but I'm going to keep on keeping on. I know it's God, and I don't care if the whole world says it isn't. God says it is. I'm not here to please the world. I'm here to please God. And therefore, I'm going to keep on keeping on. Now, what if you had patience, but you didn't have endurance? And you're only patient for a certain period of time. And you can go to God and say, well, I had patience, but I didn't really have endurance very long. I didn't wait very long. You're going to have to have patience with endurance until it comes to pass. Everything, even your salvation. So, here's a great question. What to endure? The Bible tells us some things to endure I want to point out to you today. If I'm going to endure, I need to know specifically what it is that God would have me to endure. I love this. Number one, if you're making notes, you'll love this. By the way, could I just give you a title of the message before I give you number one? Here's the title of the message. It's called Enduring Life with Patience and Faith. Because you're going to do life one way or the other. Now we're in a place of seeing something on what to endure. If God wants me to endure, add that endurance to my patience, add my patience to my faith in order for me to get the promises. And what is it, God? Should I be expecting to have to endure? Here's number one. Are you ready? Here it is. Hard times. Nobody likes hard times. Nobody said this would be easy. When Jesus made a statement, if you're not willing to pick up the cross and follow me, you're not willing. May I say this to you? Hard times is the way it is. Even Jesus himself warned us of hard times. Hard times should not be a shock to anybody that's believing God for great things. There will always be a battle. There will always be a giant. There will always be trials. There will always be tribulation. There will always be people pointing out how stupid you are and calling you name for your belief in God that you have not seen and don't know and haven't really heard from, but somehow you just put your heart on it. And I tell you something, you are an idiot to the world, but I'm not here to please the world. I'm here to please God. And hard times are the way it is. Jesus says these words. He says this, that you can and I can be of good cheer because he has overcome the world. But he says these words, in me you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer, for I have overcome. He doesn't say I've overcome the tribulation. I've overcome the world because the world is the one that's going to give the tribulation. Hard times coming to the church 
in such a way that you need to be prepared to endure what it is that you believe. Hard times want to come and rob you and knock you off balance and keep you from the things and the blessings of God. Jesus makes a brilliant statement in Matthew, the 10th chapter, verse 22. I'll just pop it up on the overhead for you. Look at this, but you ought to make notes of it. He says that you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but he who endures to the end, not just endures for a while, shall be saved. That's a pretty great promise. And we're going to have to be a people that's wise enough that goes along with our faith. There's persecution at times that are going to come. May I say this to you? It's hard to believe that someone would hate us for the good things that we believe of people. But Jesus makes it very clear and he says, they will hate you for my sake. And may I say this to you? Listen to what I'm going to say to you. It's a shock. You may not know this. Yesterday alone. In Pakistan, there was a church of 400 people, a Christian church, that gathered, and two uh, uh, bombers came in that were suicide bombers, and they both exploded their bombs and killed 60 people yesterday. Did you know that in Syria, the headlines is that the Bible is worse than, kep- capital, worse than chemical warfare? That the Bible that you believe is worse than chemical warfare. I mean, let me tell you something. Hatred is out there against those that believe God. Hatreds are out those that put the Bible first. Hatred is out there and it's getting bigger and bigger all the time. Stop and think about it. About a year and a half ago, a guy that owns an organization, a restaurant chain came out and made a statement that he simply believes what the Bible said. He did not criticize any group. He did not call out any people and say they were bad or anything such as that. All he said is, I believe what the Bible says. If the Bible says it, that's the way I believe it. And he was called, if you will, a hate group. Chick-fil-A. And the world went nuts over Chick-fil-A because the president came out and made a statement about the Bible. It was like the most bizarre thing in the world. They called him a hate group. The mayor of Chicago said that Chick-fil-A is no longer welcome in Chicago. The mayor of Boston said that Chick-fil-A is no longer uh, acceptable and no longer welcome in uh, Boston. And I'm here to tell you something. I never ate a Chick-fil-A in my life, but I went and got one after that, and I've eaten a lot of them since then. You will be hated for my sake, Jesus says, but endure these hard times. It's coming. It's building. You're going to have to either stand for what you believe, even if it costs you your life, because there's a greater life waiting for you. Are you listening to me? We don't back off. We don't shut down. We don't change our thinking to get along with everybody else. We're people who stand and endure hard times. Come on, somebody. The second thing that you're going to have to endure and what to endure is temptations. I define temptations as simply this, something that draws you into the crazy world of the flesh. If the flesh runs you in any area of your life, it's crazy, it'll cause you to end up in sin, and it'll destroy your home, your family, your children, your business, and your entire life and most importantly, your witness for Jesus Christ. And I'm here to tell you, when the crazy world of the flesh is entertained, you cannot do anything else but fail. And I know it's hard because we think we're all private and no one really knows. But the things that you meditate on is the things that you will eventually do. And those things may be sin that brings you, James tells us, to death. And you're going to have to learn, and this is a learning process. Let me say it again. You're going to have to learn, and this is a learning process. Let me say it one more time. You and I are going to have to learn to cast down imaginations 
things, thoughts, that exalt themselves above the knowledge of God and bring into captivity every thought. We cannot let the arena of our battle of faith just go anywhere it wants to. When it's ungodly, we get rid of it. If you don't, then you're entering into the crazy world of the flesh and you will die by making decisions by that. Somebody needs to love you enough to tell you the truth. Jesus, uh, in fact, James, who's the half-brother of Jesus, the pastor of the church of Jerusalem. I mean, you talk about credentials. Can you imagine if I was a half-brother of Jesus and the pastor of the church of Jerusalem? I'd sell my CDs for $500 each. <laughs> I wouldn't. Nobody would buy them anyway. I didn't give them away anyway. Here's the point. He makes a statement, first chapter, verse number 12, about temptation. Blessed is the man who endures. You may tell you something. He's not saying blessed is the man who endures temptation because you can't. He's saying, blessed is the man who endures temptation because with the power of God on the inside of you, you can. God would never ask you to do something you cannot do. So he tells you what to do, how to do it, what to, how to set it up, how to get it done, and then empowers you with the Holy Spirit to get it done. God would never ask you to do that. So when he says, blessed is the man, does God want you blessed? He wants you blessed and multiplied to your family. So does God want you blessed? Absolutely. So he says, blessed is the man who endures temptation. You don't let temptations run you and your thoughts. You run temptations out of your thoughts. Is anybody listening? Very important for all of us. Don't let it draw you into the crazy world of the flesh. Get rid of it by the power of God. We're talking about what to endure. Three things, hard times, temptations, and number three, I love this, God's correction. Oh, I hate God's correction. I want God just to go along with everything I do, think, and say. I don't want to be corrected by God. I want to be left alone. But how can a God who loves us so much let us just go in the wrong direction and not correct us? Aren't you at least a parent that if you saw your children in the streets, you would do everything you possibly could to get them out of the streets so they didn't get hurt? And yet God comes along and corrects us, and we only see God as a loving God. But can I tell you something? In the midst of correction is love. My daddy used to use a belt when I was a little boy. I hated that belt. He would make a statement to me all the time that's gonna hurt me, son, more than it does you. I never believed that until I had my own children. But I want you to know something, the belt, which is not Bible, the Bible says the rod, but my daddy didn't read the Bible. But I thank God, I thank God for the belt because it drove the foolishness out. So when it came time to mess around, I was afraid of what my dad was gonna say when I got home, and I didn't go with the pack. Because a dad that loves his kids will correct his kids. And God the Father is no different. You may not like his correction, but it'll get your attention and get you to think about where you're at and make some changes. In Hebrews, the 12th chapter, pop it up, verse 7. If you endure the chastening, that's of the Lord. God deals with you at, as with his sons. For what son is there to whom the father does not chasten? In other words, God loves you so much he won't let you get away, you're gonna to have to endure it. I remember as a young boy, some of you are like this, after I got spanked, I went to my room and I hated my father. I hated him, I hated him. I wish he'd just die. 
Oh, thank God God doesn't listen to our foolish prayers as a child. Whew. I love that man who took care of me, made sure I didn't get off track. Listen to this next verse. This is an interesting verse, verse 8. But if you are without chastening, in other words, if God's not correcting you even harshly, of which all you have become partakers, in other words, you've been corrected sometime in your life, then you are illegitimate and not sons. In other words, you really don't have a father in heaven. You're a bastard child. And you can change that today by giving God all of your heart and giving God all of your life, being born again, receiving the Father in heaven. And we'll do that in just a few moments. But I don't know about you, I want God to correct me, even if it hurts my feelings, even if it hurts my heart, even if it hurts my plans, even if it hurts what I think life ought to be like. I need, so do you, the correction of God. And we need to endure through those periods of time when God corrects us. My friends, endurance is so important. Where would there be a place in the Bible for Joseph if he didn't do endure through the years of pain that he went through in captivity? Where would there be a David in the Bible if he didn't endure the years of Saul chasing him? Where would there be in the Bible a Paul the Apostle who had to endure over and over and over again? Every great man and every great woman of God, one thing about their characters, they were in there, they stayed there, and when the world fell on them, they kept on going with God. And today, that's the way we are, you and I. We're people who are learning to put the formula to work, to get the promises. Faith plus patience plus endurance brings promises. If God spoke to you today, come on, give him a great big praise the Lord. Will you do that? Isn't that good? Real quick, I want you to endure me while I ask you, there's those of you that need to get right with God today. And let me just cut through the chase. Cut out all the religion, ceremonial rituals, traditions, and bull and say it like it is, as Sam Bernardino. Some of you that are in here need to get right with God, and you know it. You've been walking lukewarm. That's a little in, little out. Little up, little down, token prayer, occasional church attendance. You know, you're really not against God. You know you're not. But you're not wholehearted for God, and that describes you perfectly. And it's time for you to give God all of your heart and give God all of your life. Today, God brought you here because you have a divine appointment with God. You see, you cannot get to heaven and you want to get to heaven. You do not want to go to hell. So let's be honest with each other. Be honest with yourself. You want to go to heaven. You don't want to go to hell. But you can't get to heaven because you're a nice person or smart, talented or gifted. You know a few scriptures, graduated from seminary school, have a lot of degrees, have money in the bank, fit in the social system. None of those things will get you in heaven. Even if your parents told you were a Christian, doesn't make you a Christian. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that'll work. Even if they had you christened or baptized as a baby, there's nowhere in the Bible that says that'll work. It'll get you into heaven. What gets you into heaven is what Jesus said. Jesus said it like this, you must be born again. Most people don't understand what born again means, so let me explain it to you. Born again means you've given God all of your heart. You've given God all of your life. I emphasize the word given because you've got to give it to him. He's not a thief to rob you of your heart and life. 
He's not a conniver to talk you out of it or manipulator to hit you in the head with a two by four and make you do it. You gotta give God willingly all of your heart and all of your life. And if you haven't done that, you're not saved. And someone needs to tell you. And I love you enough, respect you and honor you enough to cut out all the stuff and tell you like it is. Today is your day of salvation. Today you have a divine appointment. You've had one with plumbers and doctors, attorneys and dentists all your life. But today you have an appointment with God and God is in this house drawing you home now. And today you need to give God all of your heart. You need to give God all of your life. You say, Pastor Jim, how do I do that? Let's do it God's way. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me, I'll deny you. So in a moment, I'll count to three. I'll go like this. One, two, three, and I'll pop my hands together. I'll go, bang. When you hear that sound, bang. Your hand goes up. I'll see your hand go up. And what you're saying by the raising of your hand is I don't want to go to hell. I want to go to heaven. I want to give God all my heart, give God all my life, be born again. I'll see your hand go up and you can put it right back down. How simple is that? So simple. Jesus said when he comes back, and you know he is, that he better find you hot or he better find you cold. Because if he finds you lukewarm, He'll vomit you from his mouth. You know what he just said? That people that call themselves Christians that are lukewarm are not real Christians at all and they're not going to make it. Wow. Some of you might fit into that category. Today, let's make the change. You need God on your side. You need the blessings of the Lord, the promises of God. And you need God who loves you and is a good father to correct you. But until you give him all of your heart, give him all of your life, it's not going to happen. Today is your day of salvation. When I count to three, I pop my hand together. Your hand goes up. Who should raise their hand? If you've been running from God instead of to God, I'm speaking to you. Back in the family rooms, wherever you're at. If you've never given him all of your heart, back in the foyer and the top, wherever you're at, I'm speaking to you. If you've never given him all of your life, I'm speaking to you. Get ready to put your hand up. You say, Pastor, wait a minute. Hold on, Pastor. You want me to raise my hand? If I raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed. I can't raise my hand. People I came with will see me. People that are behind me will see me. I'll feel funny. Yep. Now stop and think about it. Don't you think if you end up in hell, you'll feel even funnier? Then what are you going to raise to get out of hell? There's no exits. Come on. You're in a safe and friendly place. This is how we all got right with God. Today, just your day to get right with God. We'll be excited about it. Don't let anything stop you from getting your hand up. Today is your day of salvation. I'm going to count to three. Here it is. I'm going to pop my Bible. And today, you get your hand up all across this auditorium. Today is your day. Ready? Here it is. One, two, Three. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. There's one, two, three, four. Thank you. Five, six. Go ahead, sit down. It's okay. I got you. Six, seven. Thank you. God bless you. Eight. Back here. Thank you. Nine. Thank you. Ten. Back over here. God bless you. There's eleven. Back over here. Thank you. There's twelve. Thank you. Over here. Anybody else? Anybody else? Real quick. There's twelve wise people. Don't miss this time. That didn't embarrass them. I won't embarrass you. Anybody else needs to get their hand up. I'm going to go through this audience one more time, giving you one more opportunity. And you made your choice. There's 12 wise people. Anybody else? Anybody else that didn't get your hand up, but you know you need to? Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody? Yes, there's another one, 13. Anybody else? Anybody else? Well, let's give the Lord a great big praise for 13 wise people. Okay, here's what I want you to do. All 13 of you, I want you to get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, friend. Get your stuff. All 13, you're serious about God. Now, I want you to get your stuff. Get out of your seat. Get a friend if you need to. If you're sitting next to check with the people you're sitting next to. Just say to them, come on, I'll go with you if you need to go. And get in the aisle, meet me right here in front. No one leaves during this period of time. That's rude when the Spirit of God's bringing them up and you're walking out. Don't do that. 
you wait. I'll dismiss you in just a moment. But let's let the people get out of their seat and come. All 13 of you, and if you didn't raise your hand, but you know you should have, you can come too. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. 14, 15, and 16, come on. Amazing love, how can it be? You might be. have all come put a smile on your face this is a good thing not a bad thing you know you're not dying and going to hell you're gonna get to go to heaven <laughs> that ought to make you happy so I want you to look over here to your left here's this guy waving at you his name is Pastor Joel he's a good guy he's gonna do three things one he's gonna pray with you to invite Jesus into your heart two he's gonna give you some free stuff what to do next you know now that you've made the commitment to Christ what does God want you to do He'll tell you in that little booklet, it's easy to read. And the third thing, he's gonna introduce you to a program that we have called Spiritual Personal Trainers. He'll explain what that means. Let me just say it like this. They'll meet you before church service and encourage you. You need people to encourage you, not to go back, fall through the cracks, but to go on with God. We're here because we love you and wanna take care of you, provide for you, meet your needs. We wanna help you every way we can as a church. So please, come on, don't get lost. Don't just come forward today. Make it in your heart to plan. Give this church one year of your life, and I'm telling you, the rest of your life will absolutely explode with the blessings of the Lord. Trust me, it's true. Make a left turn and follow Pastor Joel right over there. Come on, let's give them a great big warm Thank you, Jesus. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow, you repeat them. Say these words, say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm gonna turn from sin and I'm gonna turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven, as well as upon the earth, that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Bye-bye.